everybody, welcome. We are live. Uh, today is Sunday, March 21st, 2021, and my rendezvous just froze, but I'm sure that we're still going out and everything's awesome because that's been happening on my end the whole time, so I'm just going to ignore it. Welcome to the first day of spring, if you are, in fact, in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, if you're watching us live on YouTube, in addition to the... Uh, the wonderful show stuff in the chat down below the show is a place where you can actually uh, click the donate link to help support this program and the other programs from the ACA. Uh, we are, in addition to the atheist experience, uh, there's nonprofits which airs Sundays at one and, or sorry, <laughs> Talk Heathen, which airs Sunday at one, and nonprofits which airs in the gap in between uh, Talk Heathen and Atheist. Oh, whoops. There we go. <laughs> On Thursdays, we have secular sexuality. Friday's truth, truth, wonder with uh, objectively Dan. Wow. It's so weird when things go slightly wrong here and I have to reach around and push buttons. <laughs> I'm Billy, and joining me this week to make sure that uh, if everything goes wrong on my end, something good will happen with the show is Katie Montgomery. How are you? Hey, thank you. Yes, I'm really good. Thanks. I'm in the zone. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Let me get uh, the announcements out of the way a little bit. In addition to being able to support us with the donate link, there is also an ability for you guys to go out and get ACA merchandise. Uh, and as that pops up on your screen, the link that's down there at the bottom, it's bit.ly slash AE and merchant. You can get your coffee cups and t-shirts and, and all sorts of other stuff. And you can become a member uh, of this particular YouTube channel that you're watching right now, unless somebody has clipped this out and put it somewhere else, in which case, you know, hey, thanks for taking out an advertising clip, but that allows you to have uh, custom icons and other emojis and things like that. There are also two Facebook groups that we've been encouraging people to check out. You can also support on patreon.com slash the atheist experience. And there's the AXP uh, PHILG and then the AXP private G uh, groups there at Facebook. I have lost all of it. My my rendezvous is locking up left and right. Basically, every time okay. they put up a graphic, I just get shut out. But it's okay because I don't need to see me. Uh, in addition, there's a bunch of people behind these scenes who make all of this work. And one of them should probably just come over and visit my house sometime so we can fix the things that are broken at my house. But there they are. The awesome folks that make this show happen that are there screening your calls now, making sure the video and the audio works. And and of course, Puck, who has to drink an entire two liter of some sort of orange soda every week. Uh, it's it's like a requirement. And I have two special announcements today. Uh, the first one is a happy birthday to Kristen Price, uh, who I love, who just spent uh, spring break here uh, with me and is now back home. Um, but also before this show is over, the clock will turn and my co-host will celebrate her birthday as well. So Yay! Let's all I'm going to be I'm going to be 20 in hexadecimal at midnight. So that's exciting. Yep, they've got they got happy birthday messages up. There's people posting all over chat for the happy birthdays. Hooray! And uh, yeah, that's it for the special announcements. Katie, you have a new show. I do. No. I'm very excited. No, 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 about no, 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 no. We're Oh, okay. I, I'm going to shut up now. Oh, sorry, I went. <laughs> oh, uh, sorry about that, Matt. Um, no, we're, I, I, we're out now. We're out now. I'm not sure what happened there. I have no idea. <laughs> Voices in our heads. Did that even okay. really happen? Somebody will tell me what's going on in chat. But in the meantime, uh, <laughs> you, to tell us about your new show. Burn. Yes, I'm you really excited. Yeah. I've got a new show. So basically, I'm ripping off the atheist experience. She finishes talking about the show, bring me back and in. And Call okay. the Line and all of these other kind of shows. Uh, so it's a call-in show, in. but rather than talking about religion, you can call in and talk about trans rights and trans issues. So if you want to come in and ask some advice for some from some trans people, it's me and another trans woman who are going to take the calls. Or if you want to come and argue with us, if you think that trans people don't really exist and you're an idiot and you're wrong, then you're welcome to come in and tell everyone that you're wrong on the show. So that'd be exciting. We are, oh, I can't remember what the time is in Texas time, maybe 4 p.m. or something. It's 5 um, p.m. 5 p.m. Okay, 5 it's 11 p.m. UK time. Um, yeah. So 
and that's on Saturdays. So yeah, please come and call in. We've had we've had two episodes now, and the third one's going to be even better than the last two. So should be good. It's called Cool Transatlantic. Oh no, the Transatlantic Call In Show. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the wrong 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 show, which by the way uh along with today's regular theists are always going to get priority callers if you have trans questions or for whatever reason you are concerned or freaked out or don't understand something or have a problem you can also pretend like this is the transatlantic call-in show because katie is here willing to take your questions uh and tell you're an asshole in which case we will both unceremoniously just hang up on you really quickly you can disagree and be respectful, or you can be a prick. And if you're a prick, then bye. <laughs> I, so I'm for the sorry, I, Matt, I'm sorry. This is uh, Greg from the crew. I, I yes. hate to break in. We, we were trying to get in before, you. but uh, I think there's a very special, important announcement that you forgot to make. Is there? Um, yes. In fact, there is. Uh, most, people may, most people may not know, but... Uh, Last week you weren't on the show, so we're going to talk about it this week. And this is actually a milestone for you on the atheist experience. You've been doing this for 16 years, right? Is uh -huh. that about right? Here I thought I blew the birthday thing, and now I've got crew sneaking in where everybody can hear. Yes, I've done this for a long fucking time. <laughs> well, then I guess on behalf of the ACA, on behalf of the crew, and on behalf of all the listeners and fans, we would like to wish you a very happy, sweet 16 years of hosting AXP. Yeah! Yay! Yay! <laughs> sweet! Thank you very much. All right, let's let Mac, let's take crew out. Let's let Matt get to work. All right. So six, yes, all right. 16 Congratulations, years. Matt. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they didn't tell me about that. I thought we were just doing birthdays. And then, then they start talking in my ear as if I've screwed up. And I'm like, ah. So, yes, welcome. I, I have hosted the Atheist Experience for 16 years. Um, and I'm not going to quit. So, Only bring God it, can stop him now. Bring it on. You've got to call in, prove your God exists, and then your God can stop him. And then if, atheism will be defeated. I'm so. still waiting for somebody whose God's impressive enough that I'm I'm worried about him giving me a hangnail because I haven't <laughs> run across one that, that can even do that. So Imagine being the God of giving people hangnails. I know. It'd be a really grim God. Like. Or, or like annoying itches that make you think there's a bug on your skin when there's really not. You're the God of that. Yeah. I think my cat is the god of that. Like when I'm in this room and there's cat hair floating around and it just sticks to my makeup and I'm like, oh no, I don't want to like scratch my nose live on air. But All right, we'll so we have uh, callers lined up. We ready to get to it? Yeah, I'm ready. Let's, Let's go. have some fun. We have Brian in New Zealand. Oops, I'm trying to get it to go through. Hey, uh, this new call in studio thing. When I click on talk, there we go. So let me take that back. Hi, Mike, and Mike, it's oh. not Brian. It's my, this, the screen was completely wrong. So Mike in the Czech Republic, I find it hard not Hi, to Mike. leave, even though it doesn't make sense. So welcome to the call to the show. Thanks so much. Hey, hey, thank you for taking my call. Hi, Matt. Hi, Katie. Uh, hi. Yeah, basically, I'm hi, I'm having a hard time moving on from my irrational beliefs, um, even though I, I recognize they're irrational. And I'm just curious. Do you think that some people are more inclined to be believers? And if so, what could they do to move on and be more rational? I know you usually recommend recovering from religion. I've checked that out, but maybe there's something more specific. So, so what's the thing you're still hung up on? Well, um, I'm kind of walking away from the Catholic church and my temptation right now is to basically write off the obviously corrupt church, but to like keep Jesus, I guess. And I, I know that there's no evidence to believe that he was real or was resurrected, but, uh, I don't know why I just can't seem to not like walk away from that. I, I often find with, um, like when you have an important change in belief, like a big worldview change or you're sort of struggling with something internally, you can often rationalize first. I always, how I see it myself is there's like two parts to me understanding something. There's the rational part, and that's the bit I can get to just by thinking. And it's the bit that I can, you know, work through first, but then the emotions are a lot slower to come with it. And often with something like worrying about, you know, worrying about hell or worrying about believing in God, um, I can say, well, there's no evidence for it. So it's, 
silly to believe it so therefore i'm not going to believe it and you know you can ration for all that but then something happens and suddenly your emotions are like you know i need to ask for forgiveness from god or what about hell and it makes you fear again and that makes you start doubting your rationalization and i think that if you just keep well this is what i've done in the past is when i start panicking or when i start feeling bad or something i just re-rationalize it i just re-go through the rational like uh, the rationalizations I use to get to the, my new sort of rational position. And then it just takes time. I think with any any sort of emotional change, it, it just is going to take longer for you to reprogram your brain and things to react to it um, sort of naturally. Yeah, I think that, mm. you know, being okay with like ditching the corrupt Catholic Church and yet not yet being comfortable with ditching Jesus in general um, is kind of normal-ish. And certainly an improvement. I mean, I'm happy. I, I'm, I'd love for everyone to be completely rational, but it's not something that happens instantly or to everyone or in, in all ways. Uh, but to stop supporting a, a corrupt criminal organization like the Catholic Church is a great first step. But when it comes to, you know, when I, when I ask what's the holdup, uh, you're right. I would recommend recovering from religion and other things but everybody believes for different reasons and your reasons for, for staying, you know, not being willing to let this go, um, are your own. And so I don't have a stock set of like, here's a quickie mm -hmm. response for you. I'd need to know specifically what it is that you're afraid of, you know, is it you know, because it, it, for many people, it's like, it's well, what if I'm that, wrong? Yeah. Hmm. Um, I think maybe like, like, uh, probably just hell, you know, and I didn't even really grow up a Christian anyway. I sort of kind of like programmed myself into getting into it. And, uh, I just, uh, I, I guess maybe the fear of that is, is probably the biggest one. And, uh, I don't know. I, I, I feel like I would be the perfect candidate to like join a cult or whatever. I, I seem to be just more gullible about stuff. So I don't know if there's some people that you think, or maybe other people would, would recognize it, but some people are just more likely to be willing to buy in and willing to be a participator. That seems to be my issue. And I don't know how to like stop being like that. You know, I, I certainly think that that's possible and plausible. People believe for different reasons. Some people are going to be more predisposed to certain beliefs or whatever. What I find confusing is that someone could simultaneously be the type of person who is excessively gullible and then also have the presence of mind to say i think i'm just gullible because if you've recognized the problem now what's stopping you from taking the steps to fix it which is refusing to accept that something is in fact true or is in fact likely to be true until you're given sufficient evidence for it and so yeah i i recommend you know Hey, start start going through books by skeptics on critical thinking and you know Carl Sagan's uh baloney detection kit or bullshit detection kit but basically when you're asking yourself what when when somebody comes to you with a claim that you find unusual or that may be supernatural like if i said i feel like i can read people's minds if i just as a regular and we were just sitting down having a conversation and i said i feel like i can read people's minds what goes through your head when you hear something like that uh, I, I want you to read my mind. Okay. What if I, what if I can't really do a good job of, or what if I get it partly right? Like, for example, you know, I, I'm going to say, is there like, do you come from a, like a family of four? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. How could I have known uh, that? Okay. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. I guessed. It's the most common family arrangement, so I guessed four. And the interesting thing is if you'd said no, if you were from, a, let's say, a family of six where you have two parents and four siblings, I can re-spin that to mean like, well, how many brothers and sisters do you have? And you could say three, and then I would say, oh, you say you come from a family of four siblings. I wasn't talking about your parents. There's ways for people to re-spin stuff like that. But if your first response is, wow, how did you know that? Instead of, Hey, did you actually know that? Is this a trick? Is this a guess? Um, right. Those sorts, those types of questions are the ones you need to start asking first. Not. It reminds me. I just did a debate recently that was supposed to be about did Jesus fulfill prophecy. Unfortunately, my opponent could not express a single prophecy 
uh, clearly to show that the, here's a prophecy and here's how Jesus fulfilled it. Instead, he goes to Isaiah 53 and says, oh, this is about the long suffering servant. And if we look at the story of Jesus, Jesus suffered. So I'm just going to claim that Jesus fulfilled prophecy. But the questions there that should be asked are, is Isaiah 53 prophecy? And is it answerable by a single set of circumstances without interpretation? And did we know leading up to Jesus that this was going to be what Jesus was going to be like? And now we've identified this person. Like, was there a prophecy that said, you know, uh, in March of 2021, Matt will take a call along with Katie from someone named Mike. There's no predictions that are that specific. Uh, and yet we look right. at this and we say, oh, here's this. And it looks like Jesus fulfilled this prophecy. And the right question to ask is, is this a prophecy? How do we know it's a prophecy? And what would fulfill it? And we can't do it all after all the events have happened. Mm. Yeah, his name wasn't even Emmanuel. And I've tried to get like a concrete reason for that, where it's like, okay, clearly black and white, he will be born. His name will be Emmanuel. And then people will say, oh, well, that means God is with us. But I, I don't understand, like, why not just make his name Emmanuel? But that's a different thing, though. I actually saw that debate. And you have another one with Trent Horn coming up, I think, right? I was excited to watch that. Yeah, this one's on the resurrection, and it's going to be on April 8th, I believe. But in any case, mm -hmm. it's all about everything is about asking the right questions. Because the way we tend to get tricked most of the time is by assuming the things that, you know, like, aren't actually in evidence. Like, for example, if I were to hold up a piece of paper that had a prediction written on it that seems to have come true, uh, that's one way to show, oh, I've made a prediction and it came true. But have you asked the question of where was that prediction beforehand? You know, how do I know that this wasn't prepared after the fact? What kind of trickery could actually be here? And it's a really difficult training thing. And so here's the question for you, Mike. What reason do you have to think that there is a Jesus who is actually divine. Have you ever met that person, interacted with them in any way? Do you have evidence of their existence, either as a human or as a divine? Do you have any way to show that anyone or anything could or should be viewed as divine? Um, I, I don't, and I've been listening to uh, your show for a while now, so I've, I've kind of already heard most of the arguments against, and that's what's kind of leading me out of that anyway. But uh, I think the fact that it's survived for so long, and I know that that's not an argument that would prove that it's real. But Isn't that, that true for other religions too? There were older religions yeah, than that, Christianity. I just happen to be born. Yeah, I just happen to be born in a culture where that's the dominant religion. So I'm assuming that's why I'm more, you know, drawn to that. But uh, no. So so what would be if 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 fear or if you know not having the answers is what makes people initially believe things in the first place? What do you think is the primary reason that it persists today? Is are people and I don't want to say like just the Catholic church, but would uh, like, what, what's the benefit of, of it still existing group conformity, purely, just monetarily. Yeah. It's group conformity. If I pack up everything I own and I move to a new town anywhere in the Western world, there's a church there for every denomination associated. So if somebody says, you know, if I was still like a Southern Baptist, I would have a church there and they would be willing to accept me right away without anything else other than, hi, I'm uh, a believer in Christ and I used to attend this Southern Baptist church in Missouri and now I want to join your church. And they'd be like, yay, it's a built-in community. You, you don't have to worry about being too ostracized if you're, the, if you're in the group that is the overwhelming majority. It's only when you are in the group, well, the group, various groups that Katie and I are in uh, where we are maligned for not believing in a god and i think that's true for that's true for non-religions as well like whenever i've moved to a new city the first thing i do is seek out all of the pubs that play metal music and then i have instantly have a community yeah. and i mean perhaps that's convincing me to like metal when it when i shouldn't but um you yeah should. i agree with the <laughs> i agree but i agree with that community but i guess there's also the fact that um there is something in it for the power structures to maintain themselves. Um, you know, it, it makes sense for them to try and convert people because they get more money and they get more power and more influence to push the world in the way 
that they want to go. So it's not just that it's a group of people coming together as a community. It's also there are then people who want that to happen for a, a range of reasons. And, the, and there are communities that aren't religious. The atheist community of Austin. There's a local trans community. There's a local LGBT community. There are various organizations. And so that's what all of them are trying to do. They're not trying to be religions. They are trying to uh, be supportive and contribute to the, the fact that most human beings need community, need some sort of cooperation. Some people are really fine on their own and everything else. But by and large, it is handy to say, ah, these are my people. Now, I'd love to get to a point where, where my people is everybody, but I'm not, I'm not stupid and I'm not advocating for ridiculous yeah, well, no. things that are never going to happen. But there are real advantages there. For example, um, when I was a Southern Baptist, if somebody asked me about morality, I could very easily say what the Bible had to say about morality or moral issues. Um, and I don't have to give any sort of justification for it. Hey, this is what God said you know, or at least in my opinion, this is what God said type of thing. It gives you a lot of easy answers. So you don't have to do much work. The world can be hard and difficult if you're trying to actually answer these difficult questions that religions pretend to answer, but can't. So there are a lot of advantages to being religious. Unfortunately, one of those advantages is not possessing the truth. And so if you care about whether or not things are true and you care more about whether they're true than whether they're comfortable, Religion isn't going to help you there. Religion's going to try to make whatever it claims comfortable, and it's not going to actually demonstrate that it's true. Yeah, I think people just com they, uh, compartmentalize that, though. They'll, they'll be kind of rational with everything else, except when it comes to their core belief in, in like their creator or whatever. Um, so that's why you get like scientists and stuff, and they'll say, yeah, well, I'm a, you know, a, an astronomer or something, but yeah, I believe that God created everything or uh you know geologists and stuff and they'll still say that yes there was actually a flood and all that but i don't know i guess it's you know the community uh, thing that makes that makes a lot of sense but uh that um like selective being selectively being rational isn't just a religion thing i mean as a trans person who spends a lot of time arguing about trans rights there's a phrase that i use a lot which is transphobia rots your brain and what i mean by that is um, you'll meet these rational people and they'll make these rational arguments in every single situation. And as soon as it comes to trans people, they just can't. And it, because they have this core belief that they have to hold up. And it's a shame because sometimes it means that otherwise great people suddenly are ho horrible to certain people. Um, but yeah, that's that's not just a religion thing. I think it's like when anyone has a strong ideology and they feel threatened by it not being quite right or it being wrong or someone saying you should change it, then they, they sort of shut down their rational uh, faculties when it comes to confronting that. So yeah, I, I think it can be very easy to think, oh, this is what religion does and everyone else is then sort of free of this. And I, you see this in atheists, um, often like people who are newly atheists, they feel like, oh, I've cast away irrationality. I'm now the perfect rational being. And then they'll approach some new topic like trans rights or anything else, and they'll just assume, because I'm saying it, it must be rational because I'm not religious yeah. anymore. And yeah, it's it's this kind of the same situation. I, I want to, I want to encourage, we're going to, we're going to move on a bit, Mike, but I want to encourage you, first of all, yep. give yourself some time. <laughs> you, you don't have to be ready to like change and let go of everything all in one fell swoop. Um, but mm -hmm. most importantly, just keep asking the same, well, not the same, keep asking questions about your beliefs. You don't have to ask the same questions over and over again. Although on occasion, yeah, asking yeah. the same question can be useful, especially if the question is, do I have a good reason to believe in this? Or am I just, have I just been indoctrinated or scared into believing this? You know, certainly. Okay. Thank you both so much. Uh, happy 20th birthday, Katie and happy 16th, Matt. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. I I feel Take care. Bye -bye. so young. 16. I am 16 going on 17. That's not metal, but I bet you could sweep something awesome to that. <laughs> it yeah, was funny else. because I posted my picture. I got my first dose of the Moderna vaccine yesterday uh, and I'm, I'm doing just fine. My arm is maybe slightly sore like you'd get for any injection, but I feel great. Mm -hmm. But I had my mask on and, and the mask that I'm wearing, 
just has guitars all over it. And then nice. there was a guy that was like, do you play guitar? And I was like, no, but tomorrow's co-host does. Cause I, <laughs> oh, can't, <really? laughs> I can't play the way, uh, can't play the way Katie would play. All right. <laughs> Continuing on, we have, uh, is it Shelby in Maine who shockingly wants to encourage me to read the Bible again? Is that correct? <laughs> That's correct, Matt. Hi, Matt. Hi, Hi Katie. How many times Hi. do I need to read it? And should I keep with this King James or should I go with this NIV or one of the other five Bibles next to me that I've read many times? Why would I need to read it again? I've never read the Bible I mean, from start to finish, that... so perhaps you can convince oh. me. I'm sorry, could you say that one more time, Katie? I've never read the Bible from start to finish, so perhaps you can convince me because Matt's read it apparently oh. at least once. So. Like four times. Yes, I uh, I understand that. Yeah, no, and and I understand. Um, I've been listening to your show. I first tuned in about eleven years ago, so I know a little bit about you, Matt, in that you were in the uh, Baptist Church. Um, so yeah, I I don't know which Bible you should read. Um, I would well, say for hang on, any of them kind of important. There. Hang but on, what? Shelby. This I I'm, I promise I'm I'm not trying to be a prick, but. <laughs> If you're going to call, I've you you are aware that I have read the Bible multiple times, and that I have taught the Bible both yes, as a sir. Christian and as an atheist. Absolutely. Right? And you have yes. called in to suggest that I read it again, but you don't know which version I should read. Do you know how how oh, absolutely well, I, ridiculous that you, sounds? Have you read the Mormon Bible, listen, Matt? Listen, Maybe listen. that's the version to read. Listen. No, 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 no. Okay, okay. I, I understand what you're saying. Now, if you want to know my personal suggestion, I would say the King James Bible. If you are not comfortable with the King James Bible, why is it your personal New suggestion? Living Translation Bible. Shouldn't it be? Shouldn't yeah, it be God's suggestion? suggestion. I, I don't want to tell you what's right for you. I was only saying you pick one that you're comfortable with because I think. Why that would I need to read it again? Moment. Why would I need to read okay. it again? Okay. I'm encouraging you to read it again because I believe that the Bible is true. And I believe that the God of the Bible is the true God. Okay. And why? For someone. And, and why would reading the Bible again, when I've read it as a believer and as a non believer, why would reading the Bible again do me any good? How many times have you read it, by the way? I, would, I haven't finished it. Okay, can I politely end, say, go fuck spoilers. yourself, Shelby. Thank you for wasting my time. I've read it more times. You haven't finished it, and you're calling in as if I'm somehow the deficient one. You, sir, are the one that is deficient here. Sir, sir I'm not calling you deficient. I haven't said anything of the sort. I'm not, I'm not claiming that you're deficient. Not at all. Not at all. Why, why would you want me to read the Bible again? Because, as I said... I believe the Bible. I believe that the God of the Bible is the truth. And you haven't read and, all and of it I yet. And I don't. And are you, are you not suggesting, okay. is your reason How, for having me read it so that I will agree with you? How can you say that you believe a, a book is true when you haven't finished reading it? Like, it, it, the whole last half could be wrong. Every, you're like, right, you, you, the page that you've got to from then onwards could uh, be full. I need an, no, I need an answer to this. I Sorry. It, <laughs> if, if the difference between the two of us is that you believe the Bible is true and I don't, are you suggesting that I read the Bible so that I will agree with you that it's true? Okay. It's not. It is, is that why you're suggesting it? I'm concerned with. No, uh, you will agree with me. Do you understand now? Can I, can I just give you a, a, a quick. What, it, why can you never, why is it that people when they call in cannot answer a question? Why? Oh, I, what is it that you think that I will gain by reading the Bible again? Please answer knowledge of god so you do think that i'm deficient you think that you're correct and you have knowledge of god and that i am missing knowledge of god correct i uh, i think that that's uh, uh uh go fuck yourself shelby <laughs> but bye bye i think that shelby should read all of the other holy texts because i'm convinced that they're all the real true text yeah. and he just hasn't finished reading them yet oh also spoilers i think he dies in the end yeah, <laughs> he comes back. <laughs> what? I haven't got yeah. that far. It's like all those sci-fi shows. Uh, it's so strange. So here I am as someone who's been, he's been watching for 11 years, but hasn't been able to manage to, to, to read the Bible. I correctly identified that he thinks I'm deficient and that he has found the truth and I have not, and that this is what he wants. And then he claims he's not saying I'm deficient. Well, you, sir, are the one that's deficient. Maybe read the whole book and have a good recommendation before you come in to tell me that I got it wrong. 
I mean, how many times do you have to read it before God reveals himself to you? I don't know. Like six? I, I mean, I didn't have to read Harry Potter that much. I did. I did read them all twice. <laughs> Has but Harry I didn't Potter to. revealed himself to you? <laughs> not once, uh, but J.K. Rowling did. And now that's why I'm not buying any more books. But Steve in Ohio. Hi, welcome Steve. back. <laughs> hey, what's up? How are you guys doing? Where's my Good money? Thanks. Yeah, I got to congratulate. Oh, I'm sorry. I got to congratulate you guys. Um, you did win the uh, bet. That was for you, Matt, actually. Um, you did receive what I sent, right? I, I don't know what you sent. $1,000? To, to whom? When? You didn't get the $1,000. <sighs> do. Don't try this, Steve. I got the receipts. To... No, no, no. Hold on. Come on. You didn't Come on. I got receipts. I, I got <laughs> the bank i gotta i don't have to put a claim in if you didn't get it now i did a certified mail like, did you honestly get it or not I, Steve, I don't know come on. i don't know what you're talking about you sent me a thousand dollars by certified mail to what address yes. i got i got the receipts i got them right downstairs i held on to, oh, to what got, address um i'll make sure i'll make sure that's taken care of i'll go down to the bank and ask them put um, it in the youtube chat why, below. why no 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 why would why would you have to go to the bank if you mailed me a certified check well i i, I they're the ones that gave me the receipts they have the money if they if you didn't cash it i don't want to know who did um i'm just asking did you get the money i, I don't know what you're talking about okay Steve. i'll take care of that all right never mind it was over a bet a long time ago um for donald trump being a king and uh do you remember that conversation i kind of remember the conversation um okay, okay why don't you call me back when you have proof that you paid up bye I'm disappointed he went for the fake. <laughs> I thought he yeah. was joking to start with. Like, surely he's not really trying this. <laughs> yeah. And, and he, oh. you know, he's claiming somebody cashed it and all this other stuff. Um, Does he know your address? Yeah, like, he doesn't. Well, he might. Who knows? <laughs> God, I hope not. Steve. <sighs> we, we have moved on. <laughs> and... Um, Don in California, you're on with Katie and Matt. How are you? Hi. Hi. Um, I, I thought I could get through this, but I'm not quite sure I can. All right. Um, after my son died, uh, I just realized that atheists we don't we don't have the structures that religious people have when something like this happens. You know, we so first, of, I, first of all, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear about your son. Yeah. Um, Thank you. How? But, I, I want to make sure we help however we can, but I honestly, I mean, I, please continue. I, I, I don't know what to say. I don't well, want to trample. Yeah, yeah don't force yourself. We don't, have, we don't have God to scream at and ask why. And we don't have any chance to... I'm sorry. It's fine. It's okay. See him again. It's okay. Religious people have all these structures, and they seem ridiculous until this happens. I'm sorry. No, you're you're fine, Don. I'm 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 sorry. So first of all, I mean, like always, I'm going to recommend that you reach out to like. Secular Therapist Project and, and Grief Beyond Belief in particular is an organization that is, its entire purpose is to help secular people uh, deal with grief. Um, you don't have to have a, a God or a God belief to scream out in futility. Screaming at the universe about why does this happen is exactly as productive as screaming at a God as to why this happens because neither one of them are gonna answer you and neither one of them actually cared. Uh, it is absolutely like I, I'm going to have difficulty finding any words, but you can scream at the universe. You can scream into the void. Um, that can be cathartic. But yes. if you're if you're looking at the fact that religions provide comfort where a lack of religion doesn't provide comfort, you are correct. But I would point out that the comfort that religions often provide is false comfort. 
It's a lie. It is to pretend that God needed a new angel or God had a plan or there was something for which God needed your precious child more than you did. And everything about it is vile and disgusting and diminishes the value of life here. And I don't, I cannot derive any comfort from that. And I understand to some extent, I mean, I, I haven't lost a child, but I understand to some extent your frustration at not having a a ready-made answer or something that's going to make you feel better. Um, and maybe the, the reason is, go ahead. Those kind of promises are very seductive. Yeah. And I understand why they, I think that's why a lot of people are attracted to a religion, but I, I, I think you're, I think you're right. Very seductive thought. I, I, I think you're right about that being an appealing part of religion because it's so much nicer to think that the people that we have loved to have died are not gone, that they're somewhere else waiting for us. That's incredibly appealing. But what it in, ultimately ends up doing is it makes us devalue the one and only life we know we're going to get. It makes it so that there's not an incentive to treat people right the first time, uh, to to settle rifts like if I, if I had a rift between me and my parents, I would want to fix that as quickly as possible because after they're dead, there's no opportunity for me to fix that. And yet their religion tells them, ah, it can wait, wait till you get to heaven. Everything will be fine there. And their religion's even telling them that I'm going to be in hell and they're not going to be sad about that, which is bizarre. So, yeah. Well, do you have, are you, are you alone in dealing with this? No, I have my wife and actually, uh, our friends and families have, have been reaching out and that's very nice. Uh, I just wanted to point out, I mean, like in, in Judaism, they have the sitting, uh, Shiva. Sitting Shiva, yes, and uh, it just seems that that religion probably sprang originally out of those kinds of rituals, but at a time like this, it's it's difficult for secularists. Yeah, and um, you see that uh, you know. Believing in an afterlife diminishes the life we have, but I. I don't want to diminish his life as short as it was. was I mean, you're not, you're not diminishing his life. Yes, I I know that. Uh, Like like, grieving is, you know, and it's an important step and it doesn't take anything. um, You know, it's, it's a natural response and it's important to do and you shouldn't feel guilty about it or anything like that. Um, I know one of the things you said earlier in the call was about like the structures around it. And like, it sounds like you're lucky to have your wife and your friends and family. I guess one thing I might suggest, like I've never been through anything like this. um, But one thing I might suggest is finding other people who have, and there will be other atheists out there who have dealt with things like this. And sometimes just sharing with them can, you know, you meet someone else who personally understands this. And they have been through, you know, if there are people who might have been through this 10 years ago and it's good to see them, you know, you can carry on with your life and, you know, remember the memory and get all of the the joy and amazingness of your child, you know, in, in the memory form and, and move on with that and remember all those great things. And, um, you know, you can get that sort of structure from, talking to other people who have been for it. Don, I don't want to, I, I don't want to make you uncomfortable by asking specifics about how your son died or what, what, it, how old he was or anything else, because it almost doesn't matter. Uh, I, I cannot fully, as someone who doesn't have kids, I can't fully grasp 
all I can do is, is try my best to imagine what it would be like to lose my niece, nephew, my brother, my, my mom in any of those things. And it, it doesn't, it doesn't give me the insight that's needed, but you're right that religions provide a sort of framework and structure for this and right, right down to the community aspect of, you know, we'll help you with the funeral and we'll bring food over and have a, a, a wake at your place so that you don't, you don't have to do it. We, we are working to build secular communities that are more robust, that will have the capacity to do those sorts of things. We're at a slight disadvantage because of the privileged position that religions have had throughout the years. Um, but we're doing better and getting closer. And I know that none of that matters at all while you're actually grieving. And I would just remind you that the fact that you're grieving the loss of your son shows not just that you cared, but shows the value of his life to you and your family and the people around you to show that even in the absence of religious belief, you love, you value, you care. And to the point where it's debilitating to lose someone that you love and value and care about. Calls like this, and thank you for being brave enough to, to drive through tears to make this point. Religious people need to know this. Yeah, there's a lot of phone calls about, oh, I can prove God, or you need to read the Bible again from people who haven't even read it once. That type of stuff is they're potentially important conversations about getting to the truth. But these types of calls are the ones that get to the truth about who we are, how religions have exploited us, how religions provide false comfort in bad times and troubling times, and how we as human beings need to build the sort of communities and to build the structures that make sure that someone like you has a good community around them. And it sounds like you have a number of wonderful people in your life that have been very helpful um, within your family. So I'm encouraged about that. But it's always a good reminder that we can do more. Yes, I, I, and I do have that, and I, I'm thankful for it. I just, <clears throat> I feel like I'm, not by anybody in particular, but by life, I'm being asked to rise to a stature that I can't attain. Yeah. And it's, I have no expertise here. I'm going to keep recommending that you reach out to Grief Beyond Belief and uh, other organizations because, I mean, I don't know how long, how long ago did this happen? Is it, are you still early in the process? Six weeks ago. Wow. I can tell you this. I have a really hard time putting myself in this situation. I don't think I'd be in any kind of shape to go picking up a phone and call in and talk about this issue after six weeks. I, I don't know for sure, uh, but I'm grateful for your, your your bravery and your passion in being willing to talk about this. I can't think of a thing that would honor your son more than maybe waking some people up to the fact that um, the godless aren't just Satan's monsters trying to destroy God's perfect murka or something silly like that, that we are in fact real people with real jobs and real lives and real passions and real people that we care about. And when we lose those people, we not only don't have the comforting lie to cling to, we have each other and that's the best we can hope for. Like if I lost someone having, having you Don tell me how you went through something similar and came out the other side. Okay. is going to be infinitely more useful and some jackass in my family saying God needed another angel or all things happen for a purpose and God's ways are not our ways. And he's a big old fucking mystery and why he feels free to willy nilly slaughter people in order to teach somebody else a lesson is beyond me. I, I, I hope uh, that if anything like this happens to me, that, that I have half of the strength that you have uh, after six weeks, I, I'm in, I'm incredibly sorry for your loss and we are, uh, grateful and honored uh, that you called in to mention this. Well, 
Thank you. Thanks for taking my call, and I'll, uh, and thanks for pointing me toward grief and beyond belief. I'll, I'll look into that. Thank you. Absolutely, Don. Thanks. And let us call us back. Let us know if that was helpful for you. If if you would recommend other people, you know, contact Grief Beyond Belief um, or the Psychotherapist Project. And it, the lessons that you learn going forward are going to be useful to the broader atheist community because you are far from alone in being the only person, you know, dealing with this. It's going to happen over and over and over again. And people like you are going to be the ones that while we don't need a religion, we definitely need communities and we need communities full of people who can say, Hey, I've been there and I know it's fucking terrible now, but I'm optimistic that things will improve for you and, and everybody around us. But I don't know. Thanks, Don. I thanks Don. I'd give you the biggest hug in the world. If you were standing here with me, I, even though we're still in a pandemic. Um, so yeah, take I'm care of yourself these days. Yeah. Take care of yourself. Oh, I'm halfway vaccinated. Let me get my other vaccine. I'll come out to California and hang out with you and uh, give you a hug once we get through the pandemic. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lots of love. Bye. Bye. So yeah, as a reminder, there's a number of organizations that we recommend on a regular basis, including Recovering from Religion, the Psychotherapist Project. Grief Beyond Belief probably doesn't get mentioned often enough, and I don't know what the current state of that uh, organization is, so I am hope that I'm not directing someone to something that's kind of stagnated. Um, so if you are involved with Grief Beyond Belief and you know what the current status is, um, give us a call, let us know. and. Um, yeah, it's it's rough to move on from a call like that. I think I want to. Um, all right, we'll 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 try this. Uh, John in California has a a call here, wanting to talk to Katie about something. Hopefully, this doesn't. Hi, John. Take a weird left turn. Hey, Juan. I'll be respectful. Thank uh, you, John. Hi. A quick question um, regarding transgender uh, females fighting in cis female sports, like MMA, and what's your take on it? I guess you answered it. Your call screener said you answered it on the Transatlantic show, so I'll give that a listen. But, um, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm still pretty ignorant on the, on the matter. Right. Yeah, I, I hear you. So yeah, I definitely, I just did a, a huge rant on this on yesterday's transatlantic show about sports in general. Um, this is quite a big topic. And for some reason, not like judging you here, but there's a certain type of cis man. And the first thing they go to when you say trans rights is they say, what about trans women in mixed martial arts? And I think that yeah. there's some kind of I think there is a lot of men who the first thought is like, you know, men do lots of fighting and any man could sort of beat any woman in a fight. And that, that's the kind of the feeling they have. And it kind of feels to them a little bit like a man is going and fighting a woman and that is just not on and it makes them feel defensive. And I think that makes them sort of wary around this topic. So I guess the first thing I would say is that it might be kind of a gut reaction that's put your back up first, even even if you were right, even if you were right that it was wrong for trans women to fight against cis women in like fighting, um, it might be that it's kind of a gut reaction that you've thought of this first. I'm not saying you have thought of this first, but I know that a lot of guys in the audience may well have thought of UFC or MMA first. I guess the next thing to say is that you've probably seen an example of someone, um, there is there was what kind of one famous mixed martial arts trans woman who fought called Fallon Fox. I think she fought three, uh, she won two and lost one or something. But it's very easy to sell the idea that trans women just dominate sports. People can just say that. They can say, men are stronger than women, therefore trans women dominate sports, therefore you should be opposed to it. And that, that kind of is enough evidence for a lot of people, but there isn't really any evidence. 
Um, as we know, or as some people know, uh, medical transition changes so much of your body. Um, it changes your strength and all of these other kind of things. So people often use like cis men versus cis women in their examples. If you ask for statistics on this, people often go to strength profiles yeah. of men against women or you know how the the grip strength of men against women and in all of these cases they're comparing cis people so uh, there's very little data on um like trans athletes and it's very easy to find data comparing men and women so i think people often make these arguments out of well you know it's very easy to be misinformed on trans issues um another thing to point out is i can name the mixed martial arts trans women who that everyone talks about because there really hasn't been many. In fact, in sports in general, um, for example, in the Olympics, trans people have been able to compete in the Olympics since 2004, and yet not one has been good enough to even qualify yet. So we don't have this epidemic of trans people winning sports that is often portrayed in the media. Um, in fact, trans women underperform in sports in pretty much, every, well, I think, every top level sport trans women are underrepresented in qualifiers and wins. However, that doesn't quite answer your question, which is, <clears throat> is this fair? Um, so something that I was talking about on the Transatlantic Call-In Show, which I, I, I'll try not to do the same rant again, because I, I ran for like 20 minutes, but um, something that's uh, worth noting is that physical performance isn't the only factor in sporting outcome. So. For example, um, we know that um, misogyny affects women's performance in chess, and that's why we have separate leagues for, um, we have like an open league of chess and then like a women's league of chess, and we have some evidence um, to show that when women think they're playing against other women, they perform better than when they're playing against men. So misogyny and irrational prejudice can be a factor in sporting performance, as well as can be money. Money is one of the largest factors. Um, so all of these things are going to factor in as well. So when we say trans women underperform in sports, that doesn't necessarily mean they're weaker, they're worse at sport. It could mean that access to sport when they're younger is less, that access to sport today is less, that access to money, they're more likely to be homeless, it's going to reduce the number of people participating. There's a whole number of factors here. So we're going, I mean, we're going to be studying this for a long time and it's going to be different for every sport, potentially. We could do a load of science and we could find out that trans women are very good at UFC, but they're very bad at basketball like that. It might happen like that. And we might have to have separate rules for the two sports. Um, and we're probably going to have to have a separate rule for every single sport. And then when it comes to fighting, we also have different weight categories and there's all kinds of other um, restrictions. But um, one thing we can say is that it's very unlikely that a blanket ban of all trans people is very, well, it's, it's probably not going to be the case because um, not all trans people go through puberty, like their natural puberty. Um, not all trans women are going to have gone through male puberty. So you're going to be comparing. So I'm going off on a bit of a side, side rant here. Anyway, um, so what I'm saying is it's going to be very difficult to have a blanket ban. So we are probably going to have to do some science and draw some like arbitrary lines in the sand in order to make the competition fair for everyone and it turns out that biology is really complicated and it's not just either man or women there's a whole combination of factors and so many different things affect sporting performance and so many things affect the categorization of what sex class that someone's going to be considered to be in um, and we've seen this with mm. most famously Casta Semenya who is an intersex woman so she's a cis woman and she has um, like a variation of sexual development, which means that she's, you know, different to a lot of people. And that's caused this big controversy because she's very good at running. And some people say it's not fair that she competes and other people say it is fair. Um, and this ends up being kind of philosophical discussion about where is the line between men and women and where is it fair to draw it? And so when we're talking about like, women's sports and the focus is on trans people we then have to turn to biology and then it turns out it's just not very easy and then it is going to affect intersex people and some people don't even know that they're intersex and then suddenly it gets into this whole kind of 
the legal side of things as well. Is it sensible to start testing all of the athletes to check their chromosomes and genitals and gonads and their, how they've developed? And um, it can be very, very complicated. So what I would say is in sport in general for low level sport and for like non-violent sports, um, it's, it's going to be very different to looking at the top level sports and the fighting sports. The rules are just going to have to be designed possibly case by case or sport by sport or just sort of a general inclusion because there's, there's loads of other benefits to sport like health, which are potentially more important than someone winning their local soccer league or whatever you call football there. Um, but then when it comes to top levels, we're probably just going to have to do a lot of science. And it might be that in some sports, certain people or people with certain conditions, we might have to make the call that it's not fair for them. Um, but that's not necessarily going to be the case either. Um, yeah, sorry, that was a bit of a, a disjointed rant. I hope that's like addressed what you were thinking a little bit. Did you have any questions? No, on what I've said? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. No, that's yeah, so the, an and I'd recommend. Well, thank you so much. I definitely recommend you, you run over and watch uh, yesterday's episode of the Transatlantic Show because Katie went into more detail covering a lot of this uh, earlier. Yeah, I was trying not to just give the but, same rant again. Yeah, because um. <laughs> we've got to move on to other stuff. So I, I appreciate it, John. Thanks for, for sure. thanks for the question. And by the way, yeah, thank you. Thank uh, you. For every one of you whiny little shits in chat who are saying, move on, get back to theism, I specifically mentioned that calls on this subject were going to be welcome today. And if you don't like it, you can go watch something else because <clears throat> these issues are important as well. And if you don't think that they're tied to religion at all, then ask yourself, who are the most vocal opponents of trans issues and trans rights across the board? It's this stuff is important, and I'm sorry that we didn't take a slavery call for the 50,000th time today yet. And I'm sorry that somebody hasn't, you know, that you, you would rather hear somebody tell me how I need to read the Bible when they haven't read it. Maybe you need to study up on trans issues just a little bit more because trans rights Branch are human rights. Bring, bring, like, bring your skepticism and energy for fighting against um, religious people on, on on Twitter and stuff, and bring it to the trans wars because this is the new spicy yeah. topic, mate. Arguing about religion is old hat. You yeah. should uh, move over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, has Matt disappeared? No, he's back. I'm back. It's uh, there's. I have to do a refresh on occasion. Yeah. It's, I have to alt tab or I have to kick out to to pick the next caller. But we've got the next caller. Celeste in Florida uh, wants to provide evidence of something um wow i'm excited I, I, I genuinely don't know what to think here so welcome celeste how can we help hi um um okay so i want to provide evidence that the fabric of reality is made out of a crystal that has memory and emotions yeah i have questions That's right before we even lame. get started what do you mean by fabric of reality? Because reality isn't made of a fabric. Um, well, what is reality made out of? Matter and energy. Re reality. I mean. Right. So, but like funny thing about like with physics, like you have the fabric of reality, like how um, like black holes like sink gravity in and like everything has like gravity. Everything has like, okay. Not everything. Let, let's yes. go ahead and have you make your case for whatever it is that you, because you seem to be saying that reality is made of crystals. And I, I want to know what your area of expertise is and how you discovered this. Okay. Um, I just want to say I am very nervous um, to be talking to you guys. I've been listening to you guys for a long time. And I, I will tell you in advance, this is almost certainly not going to go well for you. <laughs> I don't. Well, Okay, here, here's the thing I want to say, though. At the beginning of this call, you said this is like your 16th year anniversary, and you've yeah. never had anybody come to you and prove to you that God is real. And Correct. I think I'm really, really hoping that I can work through my anxiety so that I can explain this in a way that makes sense. Cool. Let's get to it. Okay. Um, so... 
I think I think that what we need to know first is what is fear, um, and fear? What, what is what fear? F e a r. Yeah, fear. Yeah. Is fear that related? Sense. What the hell does that have to do with crystals? Like the universe it, it, could it, exist it, without I, fear as a concept. That what? Wait, say that one more time. The, the universe existed before fear as a concept existed. Yeah, fear is something produced by minds. It is a label that we put on minds that are in an uh, anxiety-written state. So before there were minds, the universe existed. Right, right. Okay, so so yeah. how, why is fear relevant? So what, because, because fear is what we experience um, and fear is what we experience that helps us learn how to avoid death. So we are no, I, I don't I don't know how to avoid death. I think death is inevitable, and fear fear fear. Hang on, moment you could be exposed to death. I have an irrational fear of Victorians. Makes it less likely that you'll die wow. by avoiding fearful. Okay, things. I give up. Like you have a fear of crossing the street. Like I can't even get a sentence in. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Fear is the label that we put on a lot of things. Not every fear is rational and not every fear is useful. You could be afraid of spiders. And that doesn't mean that it's a it's something to help you avoid death. Uh, why not? Lots of spiders can't kill you. Lots of, yes, there you go. Boom. I think you're well, some, kind of doing some, a... Some spiders, some spiders could kill you and some spiders couldn't kill you. But None in the UK can like kill me. Be afraid of a spider than you'd be to be afraid of a banana. Okay, but the bananas can kill people too. Not as. I often think probably as in the UK, I, I would what guess. What do you mean I don't not have as the statistic. often? How I would you be, determine I'll, that? I think probably in the UK, more people die of bananas than because, spiders. I might even look at well, it. Well, because bananas aren't poisonous. They are to people who are allergic to bananas. You shouldn't be eating spiders. It's more likely. Well, it's more likely that you would. Celeste, that, like, Celeste, are you, you serious? Have... Because this feels like a monumental waste of time. You called in to suggest that reality is made of of crystals that exist within the Higgs boson particle that proves God, spirits, and demons are real. And then you start talking about fear, and you're refusing to recognize that not all fears are particularly useful. There are irrational fears, phobias that we try to cure people. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. So, what is your point? Yeah because I'm about so, to lose my shit. So my point is, if we were to understand that the smallest form of matter that's smaller than an atom is a crystal, then it's that not. would help us understand. It is not. Do, do you have evidence that it's a crystal? Like, where have you got the a idea rainbow. that the smallest form is a, a crystal? A rainbow exists. How, how else would a rainbow exist if it wasn't made out of... Rainbow, rainbows are... First of all, they're not. That's not something smaller than an atom. Those are wall of water molecules refracting light. That it, it, when they're in the sky or it's within a crystalline structure, that's not something smaller than an atom. Well, what what if I can hold a prism in my hand and it and it refracts light. It's right. not. It, yeah, there are crystals that can create a prism, but they're not smaller than an atom, and they're not the only thing that can create a prism. Water droplets do it. The rainbow you see in the sky is not from crystals. It is from light being refracted through water droplets, millions of lenses. Right, right, Wait, right, right. Why, right. Wait, why do you just say right when I just showed that you were wrong? I don't believe you. I think if you're going to say that the how smallest... How would that happen if it wasn't a crystal? How oh, my God. That Okay, please, 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 please like, Celeste, please go take a fucking science course. Yeah, this is like um, school level science. You have a degree in biology. How can you be this stupid when it comes to crystals? You're saying crystals only, can, uh, rainbows can, only can come from background? crystals. I'm sorry. Can, You're can saying you rainbows... Around? Uh, you're saying rainbows only come from crystals, and I just pointed out that the, that the rainbows don't come from crystals. Water molecules, water droplets, don't have crystals. But what if water droplets were made out of something that is a crystal? Well, then you'd what be they right, made but they're not, else? so you're wrong. That's the way reality works. If if How that were the case, you would be right, but it's not the case, so you're wrong. Bye. How am I wrong? Water droplets aren't made of crystals. You don't have evidence for the claim that you're making that well, there are 
crystals like where have these we you know we we can look at matter down to a very small like level and we have a lot of understanding and you're saying i i, I guess beyond our current understanding i mean you know there are there's a nobel prize in physics and people are trying to understand this stuff and as far as i'm aware there's no theory that crystals are the smallest thing um so i'm not quite sure where you've got this idea from or what what evidence you have for crystals existing at all i mean is your evidence like because we we know that rainbows are caused by you know we know we know how rainbows are caused by like refracting like matt's saying i don't see why you feel like there's a need for crystals to be there whether crystals are there in rain droplets or not it doesn't make any difference because rainbows are formed anyway and even if rainbows were even if water droplets had crystals in them it still doesn't get you to where you're going with fear and god and demons this is asinine right. celeste i can't i i do not believe you have a degree in biology because i don't don't understand how someone can get a degree in biology and not know the basics of physics and chemistry. No, but what if it was in the crystal? I don't care about what if, what if? I care about what is. Contains infrared radiation. The last, you need, you we're need not evidence. here to play what if, we're here to play what is, and you is wrong. Um, I'm just not under, maybe I'm not explaining. Maybe I'm not explaining myself properly. That um, okay. So, so Celeste, define things. Celeste. Define crystal. A crystal. Oh, um, well, the way we know it is like a crystal of like amethyst. So it's like uh, particles stacked on top of each other in a way that you can see through them and light refracts. Particles. In a certain way. Yeah, how can it? How can you have a crystal? You said it's the smallest form of matter. So that you're just saying there's something smaller, like a crystal. It's a structure made from particles or however you want to describe them. It's made from atoms and you're saying it's smaller than an atom, but then you're saying it's the smallest possible thing, but in order for like a crystal has to be made of other things by your definition here. Right, right. right. So then maybe the reason that we see a crystal, like an, a crystal of amethyst. I swear, Celeste, if you say maybe or if yeah. one, Celeste, listen very closely. Yeah. If you say maybe or if one more time, you're done. I'm not interested in batshit speculation because crystals are the structures from atoms and molecules. They are not the smallest thing. So every time we correct you on a thing of science, you want to say, well, if this is the case, or maybe this is the case, don't come with ifs and maybes, make your case and present the evidence. Okay. My case is that there is a crystal structure that makes up an atom. And Prove it. We see. Prove it. Is because Prove it. Nothing else can make a crystal if it's not. Prove a it. We we know like the structures that make up. How do you atoms. how did you determine that atoms are made of crystals? Prove it. Okay. If like if, a crystal is a a if, solid sub solid, um, like a form of matter, it is solid as opposed to liquid gas or plasma or anything, and it has a a, a structure of atoms. That's like what a crystal is. Uh, someone in chat is probably going to call me out here. I haven't done physics in a long time, but like that is, right. you know, it's it's just it's a solid structure, and you're talking about inside an atom, and in inside like the parts of an atom move around all kinds of crazy ways, like electrons and stuff. Like what what? How is this structure holding in place? What is it made out of? Like we know we know that oh. atoms are made from protons, neutrons, and electrons. So I I and they they're not in a crystal structure at all. So I guess you mean inside neutrons and protons. We know there's quarks inside those, and we know there's nothing inside an electron. And then the, um, right, and quarks are made out of this crystal. Which oh my God! Go away. <laughs> nope. um, quarks are made of crystals. Congratulations! <laughs> Go get your Nobel Prize, Celeste. Yeah, definitely. Glad all that definitely bi right biology into the studying commission. really helped out. We got way too many callers to continue down the parade of quartz being made of crystals or quarks. Maybe she confused that. quarks and quartz. Maybe that's what it was. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was interesting going straight to amethyst. Um, yeah. Like it's not, it's not really subatomic. <laughs> please, please define crystal. Well, we have like amethyst, <laughs> like amethyst. <laughs> All right. We do, we do have like amethyst. We do. We have Buzzshaw from Washington. You're on with Katie and Matt. How can we help? Hi. 
Hello, happy anniversary. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, and also, I I understand you had a really hard winter, so uh, I'd like to say more power to you. Okay. Uh, my call is my call is about something that you were discussing on the seventh of March that had to do with time, and I believe that the idea that came across was that everything experiences time, and that nothing is outside of time as we understand it. Uh, but my understanding is from um, from scientific uh, information that I, uh, I I'm basically I'm a physics junkie, even though I'm a biologist. Um, that Uh-oh. that uh, wow, two in a row. <laughs> hey, hey, are quark are are, are are quarks made of crystals? Listen, 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 listen. Celeste just wasted I don't know how many of my three billion heartbeats that I have in my life, <laughs> but I'm really regretting that. And, uh, but, but my, my thing is, is that there are things that do not experience time. And uh, I like don't what? know how many there are. Like, like what? The photon. No, photons travel at the speed of light. Traveling at the speed of light requires but, that it experiences time. No, 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 no the, the photon does not experience time. There is I, no passage I, I, time okay. for a photon. No, no, no. You, you're, you're talking, stop, stop, Buzz Shaw. You are talking about as if the proton is aware of it. Protons move at the speed of light, correct? Photons. Sorry, protons, sorry. Not, well, they, they move at the speed of light in a vacuum. They okay. don't at the same. So they, so they are, they are, in, the, they're, but, oh my God, Buzz Shaw, can I finish a fucking sentence? If something moves, that requires a period of time because if it doesn't move for some period of time, it is called stationary. If it moves for zero time, it's stationary. Photons move at the speed of light, which means that they are moving for some period of time. S speed is distance over time. So that's I, the I definition would, I of would speed. suggest to you, I would suggest to you that you simply Google. I did. Photons. I did. I found a Forbes article that's describing exactly what I just said. And what, and, and what does it say? It says that photons move at the spirit at speed of light. What is it? Well, I've, I've got one from, uh, from Fizz, Fizzorg that's got a thing on this. There's a whole bunch of people in chat who are saying I'm wrong. Cool. Yeah, I, I think it's photons don't move then, so they don't exist because if something exists, it has to exist for a period of time. So I think this is a this is a relativity issue because when you move at different speeds, um, your perception of time changes. So if you move really fast, like ten percent of the speed of light, and you shot off across the galaxy and came back, and you you started a clock, and the people on Earth started a clock, when you came back, your clocks aren't going to match. Your stopwatch isn't going to match. Because time, time is time, the perception of passing time is relative to the speed of things traveling. I'm not enough of an expert in this to really pull it off, and I think that kind of we'd need someone with like a doctorate in physics. Um, but I do know that it's a thing that when people travel uh, very fast, they experience time differently, and also when people are at different distances from centers of gravity, they experience time at different. In different ways. I love how many people so, are thrilled at how wrong I am. Photons <laughs> don't ex photons don't experience anything, and that context think, is absolutely useful. Useless. I think the so, theory is if you do the maths and you said someone was sitting on a photon and they traveled a distance and they would start their clock when they finished traveling it, they wouldn't the time wouldn't have passed. I um, I don't know. I'm speculating here. They traveled. I do, I do. They traveled a distance over a period of time. Period. No, no. If they travel at the speed of light, they do not experience time. That is the, that is the from their frame from the Raymond reference of the photon. It's not experiencing anything, but photons don't experience anything in the first place. But a photon, if a photon starts at a particular point in space, travels at the speed of light some distance, it will observe if if somebody were on there or the photon had any way to observe it, it will observe that there's been a change around them. It will just perceive that as everything else having moved, but there's still distance over time. I understand about time dilation. Oh my God. Okay, we're gonna move on. Well, I, I guess I guess I guess you're not Googling the same thing I am. 
Uh, so we'll just disagree. What, what fucking difference does any of this make? Because yeah, wait, so let's, let's, if, if, we there, if there's premise, a photon, if there's a photon that started at the sun eight minutes ago and arrives here on Earth, then definitely it was impacted by time. Correct. If the photon started eight minutes ago in the center of the sun, it's not going to get here in eight minutes. It takes about a hundred thousand years for the photon to make it out from the center of the sun to the surface of the sun. That's not what I said. How long does it take light to get how, how long does it take light to get from the sun to the earth? It takes a uh, well once it leaves the surface of the sun it takes 8 minutes. From okay. It's per so that, that photon that photon sun, that photon so that photon that photon is traveling years. At, Jesus Christ. I give up. Do you, do you know why it takes photons 100,000 years to get from I don't the give a fuck. I've got people in chat telling me I'm wrong, and I can't get one person to answer a simple fucking question. If a photon travels from... <laughs> Jesus Christ, would you shut up? If a photon travels from the sun to the earth, how long does it take? Where in the sun are you talking about? The surface or the center where it's produced? The light that fucking arrives at Earth, how long does it take to get here from the sun? Why is it, why is it you can't answer my question? I have um, a simple question. I'll tell you what. Bye, He bitch. does have... <sighs> like, so photons will be created and absorbed and re-emitted loads of times um, on their journey. Yes. From, I mean, the, the, like, created at the start of the universe or whatever. Um, it's, you know, I don't know, but, um, I, I get the argument that you were trying to make that the, the distance is, between the earth and the, the sun traveling at the speed of no, light. The so. point which everyone else has somehow fucking managed to not get is this photons don't experience everything. And if it takes a billion years moving it at light to move from their point of origin to the surface of the sun, that's one thing. But if a photon does in fact travel from A to B over a period of time, then it must, in fact, be impacted by time. It takes some amount of time for it to happen. The fact that you may point to another frame of reference where the photon doesn't directly experience time or where time works differently because of speed is irrelevant to whether or not photons can experience time. If a photon travels any distance and it is anything other than instantaneously, time is part of that equation, period. I'm going to concede to any physicists. I've, I've not got enough knowledge here to argue anything more convincingly. Otherwise, um, photons somehow managed to travel all that distance without taking any time doing it. All I'm saying is that when he says photons don't experience time, that may be true in a context, but it's not true universally. Uh, yes, I mean, I guess to, I, I'm I'm prepared to accept the premise time exists. <laughs> yes. I, I just find it so funny as if, oh, my God, Matt doesn't know about special relativity. Yes. Matt doesn't know it takes this long. Yes. My point is that if a photon traverses distance over a period of time, like seven minutes, eight minutes, whatever else, then time is a factor in that equation, period. That's it. So you haven't come up with something that doesn't experience time. What you have is you've come up with something that doesn't experience time in a particular context. But that, that context is useless for this. But anyway, we but have... Do crystals experience time, I think, is the question we need to move on to next. Only when they're smaller than atoms. <laughs> okay. But... Uh, let's see. We have Arnie in Washington had a question about the no true Scotsman fallacy. Hello. Uh, yeah, as applied, hi, as applied specifically to Mormonism. Um, so like I've, as I'm, I used, I'm an ex-Mormon now, but when I was a Mormon, it used to drive me crazy when people would say, oh, Mormons, they're not real Christians, you know, and they draw this line about some certain beliefs. And then as an ex-Mormon, I've listened, been listening to the show a lot, and, and Mormons will call in, well, people that say they're Mormons will call in, and I'll notice that the things that they believe don't match up to what my experience was as a Mormon, like say they'll mention their belief in hell or something. 
So my question is, am I guilty of doing the no true Scotsman fallacy? And also, I'm not even sure it's a fallacy now that I'm like trying to re-examine it. Um, can you help me out there? So Hello? I guess, um, oh. like, so uh, when when you recognize there's a f fallacy when someone's like changing the definition um, in order to make their argument work, um, and you notice, oh, this is a no true Scotsman because they're just saying, oh, you're not a Scotsman if you don't have salt in your porridge or whatever. <clears throat> that doesn't then mean you can like go completely to the other way and say, we can't have definitions with some kind of edge to them, or we can't say someone definitely isn't something. If someone calls in and they say, I'm a Mormon and I believe that um, God is a helicopter because it's written in my book, um, that like we can say, well, that's just not what 99% of Mormons believe. That's just not really what we would describe as a Mormon. And if you want to say, well, actually, this is what Mormons really are, we could say, well, all right, we can use the label Mormon here, but it's this isn't what most people mean when they say Mormon. The, um, the only time it's a no true Scotsman fallacy is when you're saying that the thing that that is disqualifying for them is a part of the definition of Scotsman when it's not. And the same is true for Mormon. So like you said, if no true form, no true Mormon would ever live in Canada. Well, there's no no line between the tenets of Mormonism and whether or not they live in Canada. Yeah. If you said no true Mormon would believe X when you're talking about a point of doctrine, when there are in fact Mormons who do believe that and it's not necessarily in conflict, um, then you're you're engaging in a fallacy because because you're you're creating criteria to exclude something from a definition when it has nothing to do with it. So it's it's not moving the goalposts mid definition. That's the fallacious nature of the no true custom fallacy. It's just if the information, if that line is drawn in the wrong place, is that what's fallacious about it? Yeah, it's the no true Scotsman puts sugar on his porridge. Well, that's not, mm. has nothing to do with the definition of a Scotsman. Everything else, you know, like, um, well, no true Scotsman would blah, blah, blah. I, we have to figure out, there has to be some definition of what a true Scotsman is before you can declare who is or isn't one. And so when it comes to something like Mormonism, the only thing you can do is look at doctrine and say, hey, maybe this is a true Mormon, maybe this is not a true Mormon, who knows? Uh, could it would it no true Mormon would ever have multiple wives? Uh oh. Well, now you've drawn a distinction between modern Mormonism and the FLDS organization. So now it's a point of doctrine. But to say no oh. no true Mormon would you know vote Republican that has nothing to do with it. So, so what's what would be like? So am I guilty of the no true Scotsman fallacy by like if when a caller calls in and starts talking about how Mormons believe in hell and I know that they don't, it, is that, am I not, so I'm not guilty of the no true Scotsman fallacy as long as my, the where I'm drawing that line is accurate? It's, it's, if it's part of the definition of being a Mormon, I guess, I don't know, that probably doesn't really add much. Um, I guess the, the difficulty with religion is that you could get in a situation where you could say, um, oh, no, no true Mormons believe in hell. And then you find out that there's like a city somewhere with a million of them in and they're all like, they all call themselves Mormon and they all have generally Mormon beliefs and they all happen to also believe in hell. And and then what? We, we can accept that some Mormons believe in hell, although it's actually disagrees with their core text. Um, I mean, you do get all of these different groups, subgroups of religions and like sects and stuff, which do believe in things which just are contradictory to their s supposed rule book. And then we can either say, well, this whole denomination isn't technically Christian, or we can say, well, now Christian covers this slight variation. And I guess that that's the difficulty with defining religions and the difficulty with um you know, drawing these lines. And that's probably why lots of the different denominations don't like each other, because, you know, lots of um, Christians will say, oh, Catholics aren't real Christians. Um, and the Catholics think they're real Christians or, you know, some, some of them, them do. do. Some of them do. Some Catholics um, are happy to point out they're not Christians. Right. And and then and then like who who's drawing this line? Like if you if someone calls in and they say, I'm a Christian, 
and you know that's what I'm talking about. Oh, and I'm Christian because I'm a Catholic. Then you could say, well, actually, some Christians think that Catholics can't be Christians, and some Catholics even think that. But then this this isn't a no true Scotsman necessarily because you're just we've just got a grey area definition here, which we might have to decide upon in order to have a conversation. Um, but if you were to say, I'm just trying to think of an example. Um, I, like, a, a, you know, a much more common example would be to say, oh, well, someone can't be a Christian if they're a murderer because the Bible says don't murder. And that's like, that's bullshit because we know that no Christians in any denomination follow all the rules all the time. Right. So that would be a completely ridiculous, um, no true, that's like a, a clear example of a no true Scotsman, which is different to just arguing about where the fuzzy edges of the definitions are. I'm curious why any of this matters, Arnie. What what difference does it make what fallacy it is? Um, well, I'm just sort of in the process of re-examining uh, some of my assumptions and sort of deciding what what things are legitimate, what things aren't, what things came from my, you know, growing up and my heritage. Yeah, but none of, so the whole new trust, the true oh. Scotsman thing is about who qualifies for a particular label. And all I would be concerned about is are the doctrinal claims of Mormonism true? Well, what else could possibly matter? I don't care whether or not somebody's a Mormon. I care whether or not Mormonism is true. Or their individual claims are true. If you've got two different Mormons and one of them, they're both saying they're not a Mormon because they believe this. Well, that's fine, but let's, let's evaluate all of their individual claims. And then we can find out whether one of them is right or neither of them are right. And then we can talk about labels. Well, my, we can decide whether we're a Mormon now. My concern is, my concern is is basically understanding fallacies so that I can avoid them. And so the no truth Scotsman fallacy is a fallacy that I thought I understood until I discovered that. Wait, am I using that? And so that's why I, I gave you guys a call. So the no true Scotsman fallacy is when you try to exclude someone from a label based on criteria that isn't part of a determination about that label. So as long as the, in, as long as the categories, like say the, any, any true, any category does not be Mormonism. As long as the, the, the category is correct, like the line where they're drawing that line is correct, then it's not fallacious. Well, I don't know if you could say correct because Potentially, if I started a new religion today called Katyism, and then I said no Katyists are murderers, um, you know, it, as part of my religion, it's, it's the same as Christianity, but it's a new sect and none of us are murderers, then like that could be true, but it could still be some kind of no true Scotsman when in a hundred years Katyists go on some kind of crusade and then I'll be like, oh, it's nothing to do with me because I said that you can't be, you know, um, and that's yeah. It it might be true at one point, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's it's still like part of the thing that defines this concept that we're talking about. It is incidentally true right up to the moment it's not. You can have an yeah. entire group of people who've never murdered anyone, who are all Cadiists, and then one of them murders someone, and they were still a Cadiist when they did it. Yeah. So it's the moving of the goalposts or the moving of the, the category that makes it I don't know how else to explain this to you because you keep kind of trying to come back with some different way of phrasing it. The fallacy of the no, of the no true Scotsman fallacy is when you invent criteria to exclude someone from a category when that category itself does not have any contingency upon that criteria. Inaccurate categories. Yeah. It's like yes. it's building it's it's I think I get it. Yeah, some something you know, in order to discuss a definition of something, there will be some um variables and descriptions that that make this concept um match the label that we're using. And then if you just come up with something else, so for example, you might say that our working definition of a chair is something with legs that we sit on. And you know that's not the best definition of a chair, and it's actually very difficult to define chair. Um, but we could we could say that that's roughly our definition. And then someone says, "Oh well, that's green though, so a no true chair is green." Um, like that's that's not part of the definition of the chair of chair in any sense. 
there's no, never going to be a point where we have a sensible working definition for chair where it, whether it's green or not is is part of it because its color isn't a, a key important um factor of this object that we're trying to describe with the word chair whereas if uh, if someone said no true chair is imaginary then you could say well yeah because a key part of a chair is that it's a real object um so it's not always obvious I, I do understand that you know often things have a lot of hidden um things that have to be true about them like if if we try and define chair then all of a sudden it's like well can chairs be this big You're like well maybe people have to sit on them but that is a model chair so that does still kind of look like a chair um you know there, there's a lot this is the the trouble with trying to describe things and define things is it's often a lot more deceptive but you can often find these like orthogonal things when we're talking about mormons it doesn't matter what color actually i probably shouldn't i was going to say what color shoes they wear but i don't know what kind of rules mormons have they might even have a rule on that but it doesn't matter like um you know how many letters there are in their name that's that's a property of people um, but it's just orthogonal to whether someone's a Mormon or not. I got to let you go, Arnie. We are past time. I understand. All right. I understand. Thank you. There are two calls that are very similar. I want to at least get to one of them. But first of all, happy birthday. <laughs> Yay. It's it's actually in one hour's time because of the time oh, difference. Oh, because of but the time difference. We'll I know. Just... I, actually, I got really caught out yesterday because I have a show before Transatlantic, which is called XX Factor which I'm just going to push now, um, which where we discuss conspiracy theories about trans people. And I suddenly looked at the clock and I was like, uh, we were half an hour into the show and it's normally 90 minutes and suddenly yeah. I had to be on the next show. So. <laughs> so my apologies to all the people who are on hold. We're going to take a call from Scott in Mexico that will hopefully address two of two or possibly three of the callers. But this is going to be the last call of the show. So if you're on there, my apologies that we didn't get to you, that we evidently wasted time on whether or not there were crystals. But Scott in Mexico has a question about skepticism in trans people, and I thought maybe we'd be able to address it to, to close out today's show. Hi, Scott. Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, my... Uh... My question was, uh, how can I tell the difference if somebody tells me that they're a, trans per they're a trans person, how can I tell the difference if they're in fact a trans person or they're mistaken or they are lying? Right. So this is, I, I guess lots of people have some kind of variation of this question. The way I look at it is it's like um, sexuality or Another example that I use is handedness. So whether you're right or left-handed or whether you have a headache, there are some properties about people that we know are real properties of people because we can make predictions based on, um, you know, the, the assertions that people, the descriptions people give of themselves. If, if, um, what, well, sorry, let me start again. Um, so we can, we can compare it to these other properties like handedness and sexuality. And if I ask you what your sexuality is, you could lie to me, you could be wrong, you could be delusional. Um, there are all of these things. However, there isn't any way that I can truly know what your sexuality is. Like, this isn't something I can actually measure with a sexuality ometer. Um, so in most cases, all I can really do is take your word for it. And that kind of, I can understand why lots of skeptical people are suddenly like, oh gosh, that means I can just say what I'm what I want and you just have to believe it. And kind of, yes. But in another sense, if we were like not approaching someone who's having some like argument about sexuality this moment or about being trans this moment, and we go and do like a census of people and we say, you know, please can you fill in your um, sexuality, your gender identity, your handedness on this form, then we know that most of the time people don't lie on these things. Um, and most of the time when you meet someone, they've got no incentive to lie and people don't lie about these things. That doesn't mean they never lie about these things. And it doesn't mean that we can instantly take someone's word for it a hundred percent, but it is the way in which we learn these things about people because we don't have any, um, 
hundred percent detector of. I have a I have a question. Yeah, go for it. What fucking difference does it make if Katie tells me she's trans? I don't care if she's lying. Just just like when somebody tells me their name or their pronouns or their favorite ice cream. No, in in, in the in the real world, it doesn't really make a difference. And and then, and, then why did you ask the question? And, and, if, and, why why would you ask a question about something that doesn't make a difference? Re, 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 regarding uh, specifically like sports, and that, that that was it, and that was it, and and maybe uh, your name is Kitty, right? Is there is there an yeah, epidemic kidding. of people who are running around lying about their whether they're trans in order to I don't know try to get a sports achievement trophy? Well, well the, the, here, here's what, what, what I'm thinking. Right, the now. answer to that is no. The answer is that is no. I'm the, aware of that. The spirit of the spirit of, of men and and women sports. What I think about the spirit of it is that the men category is it's actually human males and human females. We, 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 uh, I, we call that Scott, I'm going to stop you before you say something incredibly <laughs> awful. Did you think for a moment that we suggested that men's and women's sports included non-human males or females? <laughs> of course racing does. So I think I think what you're trying to go with is should we allow if if we've got a separation of sports or for men and women or or any criteria we that's going to divide sports. up people, um, then should we just take someone's word for it? And the answer for that is it depends on at what level. If we're talking about like um, children who are just trying to play sports at for their PE lessons or whatever you call it in America, phys physical education then, you know, children coming out as trans can destroy people's social lives. It's an incredible burden. It can ruin their family lives. It's such a big deal that some kid isn't going to come out at school in order to just play on a different team. That's completely ridiculous. However, when we're talking about top level sports where there is like millions of pounds of prize money and we're dealing with adults, um, Potentially, there could be someone who was going to lie for that. I don't think we've ever had an example of that in any sport ever in the world. But that's one of the reasons why in top level sport, the criteria isn't just, you know, I I choose which category I go into. It's yeah. um, based on, you know, I mean, for lots of sports, it's based on hormones. And um, sometimes it's based on legal recognition. Now, I don't support that because some countries don't have legal recognition for trans people. So it's kind of garbage. But there are other requirements, I guess, is where we're going for this. And um, it does, again, depend on the sport as well. There are some sports, I think, like roller derby is quite possibly going to be based on how people tell you who they are. Because uh, I know that's very inclusive for trans people. But then something like MMA, which we talked about earlier, is likely to have very strict requirements on hormones and other things. Okay, I guess that uh, gives me a little Does bit. Does that answer your question, or um, on your? Uh, somewhat. Do you feel? I feel. Uh, I feel like you're still lost. What's What's getting you? Well, when, for example, when Christians say that they feel the Holy Ghost, I, I believe that they feel something, right? And, but I'm not. I'm not sure. I think right. that I, you, I, I know where you're going with this. Not, What's the difference lying. between... They're not lying, but I, I can't really... Uh, yeah. I, I can't so really. The, difference, the difference between a belief in a God and um, being a trans person or any of the other properties I mentioned earlier is we can make actual testable predictions um, based on this. And that's this is what trans healthcare is. So we can diagnose yeah, that, children that, 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 with... Yeah, like, a, like, a great, like a great point. Yeah, so we can diagnose children with gender dysphoria, which is like, uh, what, th there's a lot of different labels here. G um, gender identity disorder is the old term for it, and I think there's maybe even a new term. It changes, but we can we can diagnose children as benefiting from trans healthcare incredibly accurately. We can, um, it's, you know, over ninety nine percent, over ninety nine point five percent, or even higher in some cases. Um, we can diagnose them as benefiting and transitioning and. Uh, improving their well-being from that whereas if this was a belief in a god um 
there's no kind of predictions we can make that that are so accurate about you know something that like if someone said they their gods told them that they had some medical condition i i think we could probably do trials and see that 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 isn't an accurate predictor um so so that's one like major difference and it's the same with things like handedness and like someone could lie about which hand they are or whatever but we can just give them a pen and they can just write and we can just see for a lot of people not for everyone because not everyone can write but we can make a prediction about which of which of the hands is going to have neater handwriting um yeah so that's that's the difference is we can make testable predictions okay and uh, i guess i'll do a little bit more reading on that and i, I really appreciate uh, you being honest and uh both of you uh, you're doing great thanks thanks and if you if you want to call in on the transatlantic call in show um and ask follow-up questions on this like you're totally welcome cheers thanks Kat. can you uh, repeat that or, or put that in the in in uh, i guess the comment Whoops. I'll, I'll put a comment. <laughs> we, we evidently lost him right there at the end. So quickly to end, end this all up. First of all, uh, happy birthday, 45 minutes early. Uh, Thank you. Enjoy your special day. Uh, happy end of a birthday to my sweetheart and uh, to all the people. Yes, I'm aware. I'm just going to be getting flooded with emails from physicists who think I've missed some very important thing about what photons do and don't experience. And I'm happy to take a look at it, but it won't be the first time. And it doesn't mean, okay, well, Matt, you explained it wrong. Cool. Not a physicist explaining it from my standpoint. doesn't matter. None of it had anything to do with God anyway, but I, I'm expecting those emails to come in. What I'm not expecting Actually, I am expecting, but it won't won't be read. I will read all of the physics papers on photons that you guys want to send in. I'm not going to be wasting any time with the people who are suggesting that transness is mental health issue or that you're I, I can't even I couldn't even follow all the little please change the topic, please stop talking about sports, please stop talking about trans stuff. Why? What is it that talks and talking about basic human rights and essential essential? ideas and notions about how we're going to cooperate in a world where things have changed, where people are starting to recognize that the world is a little bit more diverse and a little bit stranger and ooh, queerer than you might have ever suspected. How are we ever going to get along if we cannot have the conversations about those things? But that doesn't mean that I'm going to let people come in and be nasty and say terrible stuff and all this stuff. So, yeah, do whatever. Uh, I, I mean, want. I think it's, it's, sorry. Go, no, no, go. Uh, I was going to say, like, it, it is at least tangentially and partially related to, like, atheist and uh, atheist skepticism because yeah. lots of religions make claims about the world and they might say something like, um, well, you know, a physics claim. They might make a physics claim and we can say, well, that's just actually wrong. We now have measured the world. And, for, like, the classic example is the creation story it has an order of things happening and we now know from doing science that it's false. And yeah. they also make claims about how humans work. And, yeah. you know, they make claims that there are only men and women, or they make claims that all women should do this and all men should do this, or various other claims. And we now know they're wrong. So if that's not interesting to you, then that's fine, whatever. Um, but it is also another tool in your tool belt for countering the claims of various out-of-date religions. And it um, may be even more important now now that so many seemingly otherwise rational atheist individuals, perhaps prominent scientists like Richard Dawkins, are suggesting books, strongly recommending books, by ex-feminist sexology studiers who don't think that gender is a social construct and don't view gender as a spectrum and view that there are just two and then proceed when they spread, try to spread these ideas to be called out on it as they rightly should for holding views that are transphobic and harmful to trans. It's like and the last the caller. Yeah. But the last caller, how do we know if somebody's telling the truth? Well, here's the thing. Are you willing to call them a liar? Do you really want to say you're not really trans to someone who might be suicidal, who has no, no support network, no affirmation for the view that they are actually experiencing? It's not like we're just putting on clothes and dancing around in some sort of pageant 
we have created, it's not pink is for girls and blue is for boys. That's some shit we made up. And, and while genetic males may be more prone to facial hair than genetic females, who cares? I can wear my hair however I want. I can shave however I want. I can put, take drugs and change everything about me and about who I am and how I am right down to genitals. It takes a bit more work. This is the thing. There's science here, but there's also psychology and there's also a social construct. I don't know why. I, can't, I, I suspect why, but I don't know why so many people are so worried about what's in somebody else's pants or whether or not we define things based people on chromosome. Get very stressed by it for some reason. Yeah. It's and I don't know why we would try to define things by chromosomes when you don't have access to my chromosomes. You have zero idea or virtually. I don't no know idea. what mine are. I don't know what mine are. I've never yeah. cared. And I really don't care. But because chromosomes don't affect your life once you're out of the womb. Um, well, your sex chromosomes anyway. Um, but yep. I guess one thing that I would say to skeptics out there uh, is when someone calls in with this crazy claim about crystals being at the center of atoms or whatever, and we say, well, why do you, you are someone with a biology degree, why do you think you know more than all of the experts in physics in the structure of atoms, like internationally, all of their evidence you're saying is wrong and you're a layman? And, and I think that's that is a good question to ask, you know, a layman potentially could be right. We can't say all laymen are always um, wrong and all of the experts are always right. But we can say, like, as a skeptic, why, where, why are you coming in with this and why are you calling in to me? Yeah. So also, I just want to say Bizarre. this is something that you should apply to LGBT issues, too, because the amount of times someone will come in and they'll say all this expert stuff about religion and they'll be like, oh, this person thinks they know everything about physics. And then I'll say like something, something trans rights. And they'll be like, oh, it's a mental illness. And I'm like, if you think it's a mental illness, you, a layman, why are you now suddenly saying all of the experts are wrong in this new field? And it's because transphobia rots your brain. That's why. But just, you know, just try and apply your skepticism to everything. Uh, don't just apply it to the things that you like or don't like. Anyway, sorry, rant over. No, no, no. Somebody in chat <laughs> asked if I was going to continue my discussion about gender ID on later shows. Yes, especially as I find that it annoys some people. <laughs> uh, I, I've taken a lot of calls on slavery. If we take a few on trans issues, um, suck it up because that's what's going to happen. And on that note, Katie, I can't wait to have you back on the show. And oh, thank you. Everybody should go check out to the uh, Transatlantic Call-In Show and other stuff. We will see you all next week. Please. Please don't forget there's still a pandemic going on. Miami had to basically declare a state of emergency because a bunch of jackasses showed up in Miami to party their little asses off without masks, without adhering to guidelines and starting fights and all kinds of stuff. Florida's in enough trouble. The rest of the world's in enough trouble. Despite the fact that I've now had my first dose of vaccine and we're getting further and further on with vaccine and the trend is going largely in a good direction, don't fuck this up by thinking that we're through with it already. Take care of yourself. Take care of your family. And who cares whether or not a photon experiences time? <laughs> There's a pandemic going on and there are trans people who are dying. So let's focus on the issues that matter. See you next week.